nostalgia. We're running across the hill without a care in the world, deeply immersed in your childhood, without worry of the future, whatever life may hold in store for you, or anything that may be strenuous in one's life. Greetings, I am Solid Scully, and as you can probably tell by this very lo-fi cutscene, Welcome to Kingdom Hearts Chain of Memories, a game that I've had in the cards ever since the Silent Hill Downpour commentary, and, uh, well, something that is probably my second favorite Kingdom Hearts game of all time. Uh, followed cl well, right behind Kingdom Hearts 2, and followed very closely by Kingdom Hearts 3, but, again, we'll save all those tangents for later. What light? Ah, uh, fuck it, I'm not gonna read the cutscenes. Yeah, compared to the PS2 version, slash, uh, Rechain of Memories, these aren't voiced. I mean, you do have voice clips, albeit very bit-crunched voice clips, in the gameplay of Haley Joel Osment when he was still young, but unfortunately you won't really be getting much else besides this. Again, all the cutscenes that were actually surprisingly well rendered into the GBA were, you know, silent. I'm guessing they probably already had these cutscenes planned out since initially Chain of Memories was going to be on the PS2, uh, but I suppose since that kind of fell through, well, up until Re-Chain of Memories obviously, yeah, didn't quite happen. But anyway, to introduce things in a little bit more of an official capacity, here we are at Castle Oblivion. We've received an invitation, and... I can only guess that we were in the Land of Departure right now, like with that big, grassy field. Uh, I mean, I guess it does kind of make sense, because the grassy parts were still there in Birth by Sleep, but... I don't know, there's a real lack of continuity in regards to where exactly Castle Oblivion is by comparison to the rest of the world, because it seems to be in this, like, weird void dimension. Eh, <sighs> I don't know. And, uh, yes, unlike every other video game I commentate on, I will be talking over cutscenes, because it's really just sort of bleeps at this point. I mean, I wouldn't mind uh, staying silent for this, but I think that would probably not be very interesting. Actually, I actually wasn't even considering on voice acting for a lot of these, but, uh, you know... Uh, considering the fact that I can't really do a good Donald Duck impression, you know, I, I can't really talk. See, that's my best attempt, and I can't do it. Yeah, Tony Anselmo, you have my praise, buddy. So yeah, for the sake of just waffling on, I will talk over these cutscenes because what else am I going to do on a Friday, a Saturday night, whatever? But I mean, I will say though, actually, Chain of Memories is probably one of my I think, honestly, one of the better attempts at Kingdom Hearts doing a story in the game. I don't know. I'll go on as, you know, things progress, but... Yeah, I do legitimately love this game's story, I love its unique gameplay, and, well, to give a brief interlude to my thoughts... Again, the fact that it is the second favourite game in the Kingdom Hearts series for me is, well, quite telling. And uh, I suppose if you will remember back to... Uh, Jesus, what was it? Was either 2016, 2017? You probably would remember that I did a test playthrough of Kingdom Hearts Chain of Memories uh, for the PS2 slash PS4. Whatever, whenever the HD-ish collection came out. Yeah, as you can imagine, that didn't go very well because I was playing it live and I'm not very good when I'm talking live. Well, not that I'm very good when I'm talking anyway, but... Yeah. Uh, I showed off a little bit of that, but I figured... In terms of showing off Chain of Memories to its fullest extent, I'll be showing Sora's story with, you know, the GBA original, which might quite possibly be the only Nintendo game that I show on this channel. Well, I mean, unless of course I end up showing off Sonic and the Secret Rings or Sonic and the Black Knight, but that doesn't seem very likely, so... Yeah, enjoy Chain of Memories and all its Nintendian glory. Uh, but in other words, I suppose to comment on the story as it's progressing right now... Well, I mean, I kind of already commented on the story in the previous video, but for those of you who haven't seen it, yeah, where are we now? Where did Sora last end off? Well, after defeating Ansem, he wandered the grassy plains until he made his way to Castle Oblivion, in which he is confronted by generic cloak dude, which Kingdom Hearts seems to have a pretty big fetish for, because these cloaks are very badass and cool, and I wish I had one. Uh, yeah, they seem to be tormenting him, with vast riddles and confusion, which our simple modern protagonist doesn't really seem to take very well. Yeah, I think I already spoiled who this character was initially. This is Malusha. Maluxia. Lorium, I think might be his original person's name. Whatever, the Kingdom Hearts series is already very confusing as is. Yeah, he's, uh... Well, he's got plans for a uh, young lad Sora with his bright red jumpsuit and wallet chain, because this was the early 2000s, don't you know? Back in the day when wallet chains, baggy pants, and... Well, I guess massive shoes were in all the rage. 
But yeah, for the sake of summarizing all of this in a very simplistic manner, we get cards, we go through worlds, and basically, well, this is what our entire world is going to revolve around. A bit of a controversial gimmick, because not a lot of people really do like the card system of this game. I do, but I can see where people come from when they have a lot of criticisms in regards to how this is basically a five-step solution to a one-step problem, and I will get into that once we get into the combat, but for the time being I'll say my tongue. Again, you'll be selecting worlds via cards like this, so again, it might not seem like it now since we only have the one world to select from, but again, when we get a collection of cards we'll be able to cycle through the various worlds which are basically a retread of the original Kingdom Hearts. Uh, what they are, well, we'll get to at the end of the video because basically for this how I want to set this up is basically just doing a world per part, or if not a world per part, then at least most of one. Basically, I do want to be covering all the major story events. I'll mainly get into how I want to, you know, handle this sort of commentary as we go on, but for the time being, we're just getting things set up here, you know, we're just uh, setting things up, and we seem to be retracing our steps through our memories. Yeah, as you can probably tell, this castle isn't reality. We haven't traveled back in time to Traverse Town. This isn't, you know, Sora going through time. That won't happen until Dream Drop Distance, and who, boy, do I have things to say about that game. But I'll stay my tongue for the time being. And uh, another thing I should also bring up before we get to it is that, yes, I am also going to be skipping the tutorial sequences because they're basically describing all the basic gameplay elements that I'm going to be describing to you, so for the sake of making sure that Marluxia and Squall don't take my job, yeah, I'll be, uh... I'll be your guide for this wondrous adventure through the Oblivion Castle. But yeah, basically we're going to be attacking through cards. That won't be noticeable yet because we're still in cutscenes, so I'll probably save my tangents for the gameplay. And now Donald and Goofy have returned in their battle attire. Yeah, that was pointless to see them in their regular wear, which apparently was meant to be like a staple for Kingdom Hearts 1. I've no idea why they changed it, I guess Tetsuya Nomura wanted to have his hand in designing the characters. Which I much prefer, honestly. Really do like their apparel. The belts and zippers... I don't know. It's a character design sort of appeal which is... I suppose you could say dated to the 2000s, but it's one that I've always had an appeal for, because... I don't know, man. <laughs> I, I guess... I don't know whether it's nostalgia or it's just the fact that... My taste just kind of had me appealing to those sorts of designs. He's kind of shifted away from it in recent years, though. If I could be honest at anything at all. Mainly due to the fact that... I think it's less belts and zippers are more, like, plaid and buttons now, or at least according to how he designs the outfits in some of the more recent games, or I suppose more recent games being Kingdom Hearts 3. Because I mean, what other characters did he design within recent apparel? But the closest I can think of is maybe the Birth by Sleep trio. Uh, I, w I wouldn't really count the world ends with you because they were based on characters from like 2006, you know, mid-2000s, edgy extreme to the max, yo. Whatever. I haven't enough talking about character design. I am glad that the cloaks have stuck around, though, and probably will do, as long as the uh, Master of Masters story arc continues to thrive and prosper, because, honestly, I mean, <laughs> these cloaks are so cool. Like, I mean, they took something, like, so generic and evil emperorish, and just, you know, added some zippers, like, two of the tassel things, and it's sick, man. I don't even know if tassels is the right word, but, you know, the sort of thing that makes the hood shrink. I like it. Uh, cords, I guess. But anyway, without all this confusion blocking our minds, we shall enter the door and begin our wondrous journey through the realm of card games, mass hysteria, and a legitimately terrifying prospect that, had this not been overseen by our lords and masters at the Disney Corporation, I honestly think would have gone a lot darker than what we see here. But yeah, this is the overworld screen. You know, you can jump, swing the keyblade, and uh, basically swipe at anything before we enter a more legitimate battle screen. This is basically how we access the doors. We need a certain map card, which will be... Well, we don't really have much to choose from now, but we'll be able to select from a select through, which will give us options in terms of certain status buffs and, well, basically what sort of area we'd like to go through. We only have one at the moment. There's the Key of Beginnings, which is story-related, and there is also the Save feature, which is notified by that little save station right there. Again, like in the first game, it regenerates your health, it can restore... Well, I mean, it would restore your magic if it actually had any purpose here. But yeah, it also has a card value. Card values of zero can pretty much go through any door, and other specific card values correlate to a certain door. So if you don't have a high enough amount, you can't go through the door, and if you have uh, doors specifically with a key of beginnings, or you know, any story-related key which has a certain limit required before you can use said key, well, then you can basically go through that. 
uh, excuse me for that burp, I just drank a load of alcohol. Don't tell your parents. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, this is the game good and proper. We have a little map screen up above, we have the Keyblade, which we can swing at certain times to get Moogle points, when what those are in a little bit once we get to the nitty gritty details of the other facets of this game. And uh, yeah, this is basically tutorial stuff. Do we want to save our game? Of course we do. Where will we be without saving our game? We'll lose all our progress and then probably die, because without a save system, video games are pointless, we realize the futility of existence, and we have no other choice but to surrender and die. But yeah, we can also collect cards, which are uh, divided into two specific areas. One, there's attack cards, two, there's magic cards, and three, there's, you know, potions, ethers, stuff that basically restores cards, because as we will get into in a little bit, yeah, you can't exactly go willy-nilly like you could in the PS2 games. Now again, as you can see here, you attack using the cards. Press the A button, you'll basically attack. And, uh, yeah, you can also stock cards using slides, or... Or, but is it slides or slates? I'm not really too sure. But anyway, stop three cards in a row, use slides. And uh, we'll be getting specific abilities related to that as we go on in the game. But yeah, they basically give you up to three t attacks in a row if you don't have a specific, ab uh, specific ability in mind. Again, slides are pretty good, but at the same time, you can't abuse slides as much as you would think with regular attacks. Because your cards do run out, and if you run out of cards, you basically have to use the reloading tool, which you have to hold down, and uh, not tap, as I did in my previous Reach Out of Memories video, because that was the first time I played the game and I was a fucking dumbass who should probably die, because I have no place in this existence. But again, what you do when you win battles, aside from getting experience and, you know, leveling up like you do in all good RPGs, is that you get uh, map cards, which you can use to, you know, fulfill certain requirements, depending on the door, or, you know, can give you certain status buffs, as we will soon see uh, shortly after, as you got, saw before, we got Sleeping Darkness, which is basically leaving all enemies sterile as they have a nice little nap, or Sora just goes on his merry way. And uh, besides that, well, yeah, you'll probably see the evidence for yourself as we go on. Although we haven't really used it yet, we also have the level-up system, and compared to Kingdom Hearts usually, where, you know, you just sort of level up in certain abilities depending on what sort of path you chose at the beginning of the game, here you can choose between health, card points, which is basically how you can increase your stock of cards which you can use in the battle, which I highly recommend you get first, because, trust me, you're gonna need it. And you can also get, uh, slide abilities, which basically, by combining certain cards together, like, of a certain total value, like if you have 555, as we're probably gonna be seeing quite soon, yeah, you'll be getting a slight called Sliding Dash, which, again, similar ability to the first game, however, if you use a certain slight, well, basically, you can use the sliding ability, and that's how you get things done. And as you can see here, we also have the ability of friend cards, which basically summon, you know, Donald or Goofy into battle, and they'll give certain attacks. I think Donald is basically healing and using a certain magic attack, which uh, is random, so I hope to god you're not facing a fire enemy when you're attacking one of the enemies there. And, uh, well, he'll either do damage or be your worst enemy. The choice is yours, Neo. And of course, Goofy, being the power of house that he is, will basically launch into a bunch of certain attacks, like, you know, yeah, like that. The useful ones. And again, um, the only sort of battles that I'm going to be really be showing is mainly down to uh, two factors, really. One, a couple of battles per screen. Uh, usually the only ones where I level up and get a new slide, and, well, generally, uh, ones that progress the story relatively quickly, because while Chain of Memories is one of my favorite games to play, one of the few down uh, points that I really do have to say about the game is that it is very grind-heavy. And, uh, yeah, in order to cut down on all that, I'm going to basically be showing you a couple of battles here and there, but mainly I'm just going to be getting on with the plot, and likewise, as you will soon see when we get to uh, the, you know, Disney franchise, insert, quotation mark, trademark, copyright, LTD, whatever sort of things, yeah, the story's going to be significantly cut down, because basically it's, well, you could consider Chain of Memories a retread of Kingdom Hearts 1, but that's only really in terms of the original worlds that you visited. All the stuff in the Castle Oblivion, that's all original. So, I'm gonna mainly be commenting on that for the most part, but I will show off at least, uh, Traverse Town, because, you know, that's basically getting you to grips with how exactly story works in a Kingdom Hearts game. Well, in Kingdom Hearts Chain of Memory specifically, and also the, uh, Hercules world, because that was one of my favorite worlds in Kingdom Hearts 1, and, well, it basically shows you that it is a retread of the first game, except with minor elements in regards to how, you know, memories and how this isn't exactly a real place, just a facsimile what Castle Oblivion is presenting to the player. I don't know, it's a bit strange and metaphysical, but it's one that I think Kingdom Hearts handled surprisingly well, or at least a lot better than it 
reasonably needed to be. I mean, Chain of Memories could have just as easily have been like a shitty port of the first game with like Zelda-esque controls, but no, they gave it a unique battle system, they gave it its own unique story, and did make it a legitimate sequel to the games, because uh, yeah, if you jump from Kingdom Hearts 1 to 2, you would be pr well, I wouldn't say that lost, but lose out on a lot of the details that Chain of Memories did clear up, and uh, yeah, while this game is for a majority a rehash, there is quite a few things that you can miss out on, and as we saw with, you know, the preludes to different characters, like the blonde girl that we saw in the Mysterious Tower, well, yeah, there's a lot going on that is required viewing for Kingdom Hearts 2, so pay attention, kiddos. But again, I think unlike later Kingdom Hearts games, which got really invested in the whole sort of Xehanort thing, this is still kind of a half and half kind of thing. Like, there is a lot of complications to the plot, a lot of, uh, darker elements, or at least in terms of exactly what is going down to Stora and everybody else down here. But at the same time, there's also that... Again, I, I hesitate to use this, but this whimsical charm that Kingdom Hearts 1 was most famous for, because, you know, it was a one-game sort of deal, they weren't sure how the franchise was going to do. And as is quite evident with how Kingdom Hearts is today, well, yeah, the franchise took off in ways that nobody else could have expected or imagined from a Final Fantasy and Disney crossover. And speaking of Final Fantasy, we have Squall, from my favourite Final Fantasy game of all time, Final Fantasy VIII. Without the, uh, you know, beautiful fluffy colour on his jacket, because apparently that was a bit too difficult to render, and Tetsuya Nomura was feeling a bit dickish that day. Good old though, I do still kind of like, um, Squall's Kingdom Hearts 1 design. I don't know, something about it just feels... cool. In a, a way that I can't really describe. I mean, I do still like his Final Fantasy VIII and Kingdom Hearts 2 look, but... Eh, I don't know. I guess maybe it was to kind of design the characters to be unique to Kingdom Hearts itself before they just went, screw it, and just made the character designs their own, because you will notice this in Kingdom Hearts 2, like how they stuck with the Final Fantasy era designs for the characters. Whereas here, they kind of go for a mixture. I, I don't think Yuffie is really a good example, because she kind of has Riku's look from Final Fantasy X, because that was initially meant to be Riku, except for the fact that, well, there's a Riku in Kingdom Hearts, so that probably would have been a bit confusing. Not that it really matters, because Riku did end up in Kingdom Hearts 2 as, like, uh, like one of the trio with Yuna and Pain, I think. Ugh, it's weird, Kingdom Hearts and his bizarre Final Fantasy cameos that are now going by the wayside, because apparently they have their own cast now, and don't need Final Fantasy anymore, but if then again, if that's the case, then shouldn't the Disney properties be equally superfluous? I see what you're doing there, Disney, you evil lords and masters that will probably enslave the world at some point in time. I'm onto your game, bitches, and I will destroy you with the power of rock. What am I saying here? I have no idea. But anyway, uh, yeah, apparently Squall and Yuffie don't remember us, so we need to find Aerith, the sagely, sagely lass who will die in the upcoming Final Fantasy remake, which is coming out next year. Uh, I mean, I'll pick it up. Uh, I mean, Final Fantasy VII probably wasn't the favourite game of mine, but I mean, I still enjoyed it. Well, I haven't played it since my emulated days of 2010 to 2015, but, you know, I'm looking forward to it, even if it is an episodic formula, which, I mean, has its drawbacks and, uh, you know, all that sort of thing, but I mean, I'm pretty sure considering the fact that the game probably is, like, popular enough so that people will bite up these sort of episodic releases, you know, I think it'll work, at least a lot better than what, you know, fucking Telltale did with the Walking Dead games, what the fuck happened there? Uh, but anyway, yeah, also cutting out the Squall battle, because that's basically teaching you about slights and a bunch of other crap that I'm going to be teaching you. It's all about me! Squall won't teach you, it's about me! Where's my Final Fantasy game? Uh, Square Enix, which has Uni Uji Naka working for it, apparently. But yeah, the Key of Gardens, that's basically... Again, it'll either lead you to a boss fight or your se um, second story scenario, which will be... Again, continuing to cover the plot of other Kingdom Hearts related paraphernalia. Basically what happens is that why don't you have a Disney movie, and include an anime boy, a duck and a dog, then you get Kingdom Hearts. So, yeah. Not much really changes, I mean, it's basically the same sort of plot that you saw before, but, you know, with a vague inclination towards memories. Uh, not a lot of the plots really tend to go for it, it's mainly just... Well, I think one or two worlds in particular. I know uh, Halloween Town has one, which is bit of attention I will get into because, you know, there is the implication that, uh, what was it, S uh, Spooky Boogie does have a realization about his existence in an existential kind of way, but I'll cover that when we get to Halloween Town, but for the time being, this is Traverse Town where 
We're just figuring out things. How the plot is going. And yeah, this is what I was talking about with the card doors. Basically, get the card of that specific value or higher, and then select the Key of Guidance and you're in. And now we meet Aerith. Eris. Aerith. Yeah, fuck, I'm calling her Aerith because that's basically how I knew her first off from the Kingdom of Hearts series. Trademark. Copyright. LTD. TM. And Aerith seems to have a bizarre amount of knowledge for something that is what is basically a figment of Sora's imagi- well, I wouldn't say imagination, but a figment of Sora's memories. Because, yeah, to spoil a few things here, and again, some might find this a little bit dickish, but I mean, I think it- I think I might as well clear up Chain of Memories plot as much as I can, because a lot of people I have found do get confused by this game's, uh, standing. But yeah, all these characters, they're not the originals that we met in Kingdom Hearts 1, they're just parts of Sora's memory that have been lanes scattered and disconnected. And what this has meant in, well, the real world is that Sora has basically been forgotten by basically everybody he ever met. Uh, who's responsible for this and why this is happening? We will see later on, but yeah. This is why everybody's having such a hard time remembering who Sora is, and why he's trying to pick up the pieces and rechain his memories together. That's the name of the game, da 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 da. But yeah, this is basically why we're also recalling a bunch of stuff that happened in Kingdom Hearts 1, like at the very end, where we will meet again, blah blah blah. Uh, before you go off and do all the work while we just stand here in the control room, you can fight behemoths and fight Ansem because, you know, despite the fact that we have also fought bizarre god demons from hell and, like, time manipulation witches, yeah, we'll just sit by the sidelines and let this 14-year-old boy sol solve all our problems for us because, yeah, we're lazy. Well, that's the price you pay for being a protagonist, I suppose, but I mean, you know. I suppose it would be cool to have some Final Fantasy members as your party members, or even having a Final Fantasy world in general. Whereas, like, I don't think there's really been a lot of crossover between Kingdom Hearts and Final Fantasy now that I think about it. I mean, I th the closest thing I can think of is, like, I want to say World of Final Fantasy, which is, like, where Sora is, like, a... Is he, he's either a summon or an unlockable character in that? I'm not really sure where the rights lie with Sora, like, is he a Disney thing, is it Square Enix, or is it like a shared between where, they, where it has to specifically be a Kingdom Hearts thing for him to appear? Or he can only appear for like a limited time, kind of like the clause that they had with the King in like, uh, the first game? I don't know, it's been very confusing to see how this sort of rights management thing has really worked itself out, but... I don't know. I'm not really sure how to complain, because again, this was Uncharted Waters and they weren't really sure how this game was going to come out, because... I guess maybe in part to it being made in the early 2000s when people didn't really take video games all that seriously, but seriously enough to consider, you know, making all these wacky, crazy ass sort of deals like combining Disney and Final Fantasy. Yeah, this was a shot in the dark, and the fact that it became the worldwide success that it was is... Well, I mean, it's understandable, because, I mean, a lot of the stuff that you see in Kingdom Hearts, I mean, I know it gets a lot of flack from people for being too, conv too convoluted, you know, too taking itself too seriously and all that, but at the same time, it's also the sort of franchise that you would not see doing the sort of things that it does anywhere else. Especially in this day and age when, you know, video game companies have to be a lot more careful and sporadic about their releases. I mean, I sincerely doubt that a game in today's day and age would use the combat system with Chain of Memories. Or really even have the sort of plot about it, considering, you know, the very... Uh... How do I put this? The very meta-driven sort of shit that we have today in terms of narratives. I don't know. I'm getting cynical again. I don't, I don't want to avoid that, because Kingdom Hearts, for as whacked out as the plot can get, is one that does legitimately make me smile, if only for its sincerity. Like, a lot of people can call it schmaltzy if you want, but... I don't know. There's something I've always found so charming about how Kingdom Hearts just sort of believes in itself, and it's... weird, confusing, labyrinthian story. I don't know. Maybe I'm just a bit of a sap deep down, but... I kind of beloved, it, man. What can I say? Anyway, you can also get health balls on Mookle points. Mookle points, well, again, I'll establish when we get there, but... Yeah, health points, restore your health from battles. I mean, you can also have cards that heal you, again, with the whole magic system. But otherwise, you know, not much else. And again, that was also an example of the Sleeping Darkness, which, again, saw the enemy sleeping. If you can get a hit on them early, you can stun the enemies and thus give you a chance to... kind of get the drop on them and basically attack them to your heart's content. But I mean, otherwise, you know, Heartless walking around, again, if they get you, well, then basically you'll enter into a normal battle where they'll start running around first off, or if they do get the drop on you, then Sora will be kind of dizzy for a little bit, and then you can start attacking. Weird sort of thing, but, you know, nothing terrible. 
And it's Sid, the yeehaw sort of western talking guy. I can't really do a good Sid impression. Basically because I don't really remember his voice. Like, I think he only had a couple of lines in Kingdom Hearts 1 and 2, so... Yeah. And we probably won't ever see him again either, because apparently Kingdom Hearts is its own cast now. Uh, Allegedly. I don't know. I, I still ca I mean, I'm still kind of bitter that we didn't see a lot of Final Fantasy characters besides the Moogle in Kingdom Hearts 3, but... I guess maybe the DLC will rectify it, or possibly maybe one of the future spin-off games, or possibly Kingdom Hearts 4. Yeah, but whatever. I guess we'll probably have to wait until after the Final Fantasy VII remake is done before we see anything new. I don't know. I mean, I just sort of hope that they handle the next story arc with a little bit more grace than they did with Kingdom Hearts 3, because... There were a lot of reasons why it was delayed as long as it was, and there is also... Well, a great deal of... Uh... I'm not really sure what to call it. I don't know whether it's just changing with the times, or the fact that a lot of the ways of delivering the spin-off games have kind of changed over the years. Again, I am kind of alluding to Unchained X, or whatever the fuck the mobile browser game is called now. But, uh... Yeah, needless to say, if I was to choose between that and the handheld titles, I would probably go for the handheld titles. I mean, say what you will about Birth by Sleep and uh, Dream Drop Distance as they are as games, but... You know, I'd easily take another Chamber of Memories, or even that over a fucking browser game that you have to keep up with continually, and... The fact that it's just sort of ties in with the main plot has been a long-standing problem, and you could argue that Chain of Memories is the source of all this, but... Uh, I don't know, there are ways of going about it, and I think the way Chain of Memories and even the handheld titles did go about it was at least direct, because, you know, you could at least count that as a major release, even if it was a spin-off and not a major experience on the PS3 or PS4 or whatever. And anyway, as you can see here, like before, you'll know that you're up to the final stretch of the uh, level when you come across the boss fight. And these uh, work a little bit uniquely to uh, the average fight in the game. As you can see there, we just collected a symbol of the king, which is basically a gimmick card. What that does is that it basically uh, incapacitates the boss for a little bit, giving you a chance to attack. We also have a summoning card, again, similar to the summons from Kingdom Hearts 1, where you have, you know, simply giving a loud roar. And he will, you know, deal a bit of damage. But yeah, as you can see the gimmick card right there, it disables the boss for a little bit, go to town on it, and you should be golden. Won't stay down forever, obviously, but, you know, do your best, keep at it, and you will defeat the boss. God armor isn't exactly so difficult. Again, I wouldn't really worry too much about it, but, you know, I mean, if you are underleveled, this game will have no ch <laughs> this game will show no punches of kicking your ass, because, well, let me just say, Chain of Memories does have its moments of bullshit. I am looking at you, the fucking trick master, because... Yeah, I dread going up against that boss, I can never complete it without dying. But otherwise, I mean, it's nothing to really get upset about, you know. Keep at it, keep attacking, and uh, make sure to reload your cards, use some potions when necessary, and you should be okay. I don't know, I mean, Chain of Memories for all that people do sling on it, it's mainly just, I think, more so down to the fact that a lot of people weren't really coming to grips with the card system, and keep in mind, I wasn't really up to clown with it either, back when I uh, initially played it, but... As time went on, I really got into the sort of combinations that you can get with the slides, you know, the different sorts of ways you can counteract enemies, because one little nifty feature of the gameplay, if you have a zero card, you can basically counteract any enemy card by disabling any sorts of attacks they have planned or anything else. And if you have a card of a higher value than theirs, you can also stop their attack that way as well. But another thing to also keep in mind is that, again, with zero cards, if they pull out a higher level card immediately after, well then, yeah, they can also stop your attacks as well. So it adds a... It adds a nice little sort of strategic element. It's nothing that you need to be a super genius or need to think like five moves ahead in order to get, but it is something that I do appreciate over the press the X button to smash something into oblivion. And not that I even really consider that to be necessarily a bad thing either, because I mean, I do like simplistic combat sort of games, but it is also interesting to see in how, you know, adds a little bit of strategy, but, you know, allows the general sort of player that, you know, just wants to beat the shit out of enemies and just go on their merry way in a more reasonable manner. Again, I think Riku Scenario, which is the reverse rever rebirth portion of the game, probably does allow for a much more uh, consistent experience to what people expected from the first game, and one that I would recommend you play first when I'm pretty sure you have to complete Sora's story beforehand, uh, before you get to any of that. But whatever, we'll cover- we'll talk about Reverse Rebirth at a later date, but for the time being, we defeated the guard armor, and then all our friends like, Oh, if only- do you really have to go? And they have to go, I'm sorry man, adventures are on the horizon. People to see, bitches to fuck, 
money to be made. So long, motherfuckers. But there is actually a bit of a creepy element to this, which... Again, although the characters themselves don't really consider it because, you know, they're rather simple-minded beings, uh, yeah, does kind of highlight the horror that Chain of Memories could have potentially gone had it not been, well, under lock and key by their lords and masters, the evil Disney Corporation. But again, a story I will comment on a little bit more next part, because, well, again, as you will allude to here, there is a lot of creepy elements here. Basically down to the fact that, yeah, even that some of these characters don't exactly know how real they are, and again, I think particularly in Halloween Town, they kind of, well, I think I honestly should have gone for more of that sort of self-realization sort of thing. I mean, just to really drive up the sort of existential horror. I mean, there is a lot more going on that I will comment on, but yeah, even from the outset, you can tell that Chain of Memories is a game that is much more atmospheric and very, well... I don't really know what the word is. It's not creepy, but I guess eerie might be the best word to describe it. You know, sensing things that you shouldn't... Uh, you know, being unsure about whether or not your memory is lying to you, or if everything that you're seeing is the truth. It is bizarrely fucking atmospheric, man, and quite frankly... Well... God... I don't even know how to describe it, but again, it's a game that does make me really excited to replay it. Yes, what exactly does it mean? The answers... we will find out. Aerith can't give us all the answers. And now Sora's depressed, and god forbid we have a depressed Sora. Who I think is... I think by Chain of Memories is probably the only real game where we ever really see Sora beyond... Uh, the general happy-go-lucky sort of shonen protagonist that we've seen him in pretty much every other game, because I mean... While Sora had, like, you know, a different ray of emotions, he never really gets to the point where he's broken down or anything, you know, compared to Chain of Memories. I mean, there are parts of the first game, and I guess maybe a little bit of Kingdom Hearts 3 in there as well, but Chain of Memories is the one that I think really does explore his personality in terms of, well, being a fully developed character, if I can uh, be quite frank with you all. And now Aerith has gone. <gasps> Dunno! -dun -dun. Was she ever there to begin with, or something more? I wonder, dear boy. Well, no, she wasn't there to begin with, because she was an illusion. Born of Castle Oblivion's machinations, as you can see many of these rooms formatting to the memories of the characters. But we will see that as we go on, and uh, one thing that I will point out about the layouts of the castle for later. But again, whenever you defeat the boss, and, you know, you get the ending cutscene as you do here, well, basically, you basically ascend a ladder and head off to new adventures. So I guess on that note, I am Solid Scully, keep a new metal, and, uh, well, hope you're looking forward to the rest of this commentary, so I will see you next time in Kingdom Hearts Chain of Memories Part 2. Catch you later.